Morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're just going to wait uh, one more minute as a number of uh, people are still joining us. So just give us one minute and then we'll kick off. Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us at today's session, uh, which forms part of this year's Business Finance Week. So this is the second year that um, Business Finance Week has taken place and we're really delighted that today's event is one of 27 taking place uh, all across the UK. So my name is uh, Chantal Gill and I've recently joined British Business Bank as the Chief Risk Officer. Don't let that put you off. Um, British Business Bank is a government owned bank, but it's independently managed um, and it's an economic development bank. And we're really committed to breaking down the disparities in access to finance for smaller businesses across the UK. And British Finance Week brings a great opportunity for us to work collaboratively across the business support community to really help small businesses find out more about the different finance options that can make a difference to them. And we're grateful today to the UK Business Angels Association, the trade body for angel and early stage investing, who are partnering us for this event. So feedback from businesses who attended last year was really positive with attendees telling us that they felt better informed about the finance options available to them and seven in 10 plan to find out more about the finance as a result of attending last year's events. A number then went on to secure grant, debt and equity funding. So it really paid off for them. Anyway, on to today's event, um, which I'm delighted to be opening. Today, we are unlocking innovation uh, and looking to build the business of tomorrow. So innovation is such a great theme. Um, it could help you to unlock the full potential of your business and help you build the business of tomorrow. So you might be a small cutting edge startup looking to bring your fantastic product to market, or you may be a business who's just looking to stay competitive and better meet the needs of your customers. Whatever you are actually thinking about the best use of finance to solutions so you can stay ahead of the curve is, is well worth the effort. And we're aiming to help you with that endeavor at today's event, which brings together experts in angel investment and investors, and they'll be offering you practical advice on raising funds. So the session runs for about an hour and a half, and there will be plenty of opportunities for Q&A with our esteemed panel. Um, if you have a question, if you'd like to post it in the portal, and um, we will address as many of those as we can during the session. Um, and otherwise, we will aim to um, respond outside of the session if we don't get through all of the questions. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from all our speakers today. Um, thank you for being here as part of British Finance Week. Uh, and I'd now like to introduce Paul Sullivan, a senior manager in our UK network team, and he'll be introducing our first speaker. Morning. Thanks Paul. very much, Chantel, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, it, it, really looking forward to today's session. Um, there'll be some great information and advice coming from our attendees today. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce Rod Beer, who is the Managing Director of UK BAA, who is going to run through uh, Raising Investment Masterclass. So over to you, Rod. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. And it's very good to be here. I'm very pleased to be partnering with the BBB and kind of sharing, I guess, some of my knowledge that I've built up over about 18 years around angel investing as well with you here today. I've got quite a few slides to run through. I'm also very conscious that I've been given quite a big task. I've been given 35 minutes to run you through a bit of a masterclass on angel investing. So I'm conscious that you as founders out there are very busy, you've got businesses to run. So I'm going to go through this at quite a rate of knots. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be able to be able to follow along. Um, we do, I believe we're running a, a panel session a little bit later. So if you have questions about anything that I've mentioned or said, then do feel free to post them in the Q&A uh, and we can pick that up as a panel a little bit later on as well. So looking forward to kind of interacting with you guys as well. So 
I'm going to put my camera back on. There we go. Here I am. No, great stuff. So looking forward to it. Quick introduction on who we are as well, for those of you less familiar with our work. So I'm the uh, Managing Director of the UK Business Angels Association. We are the trade body for angel and early stage investing. It's our job essentially to really help support all those that deploy capital across the UK. So we look after lots of angel groups, investment funds, online platforms, family offices, really a very broad cross section of those. Um, I think in all told, our members are currently investing over £2 billion every year into high potential, high growth UK based businesses. So we're an active, exciting bunch. Um, and as a trade body, our job is many and varied. We do a lot of work around building better connectivity for our members. So we do a lot of work around events. We had a big event at uh, Royal Club Engineering last night, all around space, which is quite cool. We do we operate a deal sharing platform. We have a number of angel hubs around the country. So really, it's about bringing angels, investors and VCs together to invest collectively into fantastic founders. We're big about that. We love education. So we work quite hard to educate and train investors how to successfully and effectively deploy their capital. And as a result, we're pretty good at helping founders learn how to get some money out of them at the same time. Finally, we also work around representation. So for us, that representation piece to us means that we it's up to us as a trade body to identify the challenges in the industry and then to actively work to solve those challenges. So those are things around improving access to finance outside of London, the Golden Triangle. Um, and actually, one of the challenges, I live in Surrey, I live in the Southeast, so I'm very familiar with the challenges that we face because we're lumped in with London and the Southeast. But actually, if you're based outside of that kind of outside of London, but you're still in the Southeast regarded as, it still can be quite hard to find capital a bit locally. So I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the hurt that you found us maybe feeling, feeling out there. Um, we also work around building more diversity. So we actually, um, we run the Investing Women Code with government. We do a lot of work across the, throughout the year, really in helping to increase the diverse backgrounds of investors, not just the founders as well. I think it needs to be changed at the entire level throughout the entire chain as well. And then finally, we work around sector activation. So making sure more investments going into the exciting sectors that we think will drive the UK PLC. So things like creative industries, space, like I said last night, uh, engineering, deep technologies, AI, all the kind of cool stuff that we think the UK is really strong at, but ultimately, um, needs more capital. So that's us in a nutshell. I'm going to now move on and start off a little bit. I want to, I, what I want to do for the session is within this 35, probably now 30 minutes, go through, hopefully you give you an understanding about whether you're right for angel investing, whether it's actually relevant for you in the first place. I want to explain a bit about, you know, kind of who's then out there, who are the investors, where are they, what does it look like, the kind of the broader ecosystem, where does it sit without amongst the other different forms of funding that you've probably heard of, um, and then probably touch a little bit about um, some um, process of actually going out and get it and who you can go to as well. So let's, let's crack on. So first of all, my first big question, the first section really is, are you right for investments? So I'm going to talk a bit about what investors are looking for fundamentally and what you should be looking like in order to attract and engage with investors and get them to, to part with their, their hard written checks. So first of all, the big thing here is the power law. Are you familiar with the parallel? It means it's the 80-20 rule that basically 80% of output comes from like 20% of the input, basically. It's kind of, it's really prevalent across finance. It's really prevalent across particularly early stage and VC funding. You'll see this, this graph, you don't have to unpick the graph. I'm going to tell you what it's telling you. It's telling you that actually for any investor that invests in lots of founders, any founders whatsoever, 80 to 90% of all of our successful returns comes from just 10 to 20% of, of our portfolio. So we know we're only going to get any return whatsoever, any meaningful return on our investment from like one or two in 10 of the companies that we invest in. So I needed you to understand that because it means that if we're only going to get anything out of one or two in 10 other companies we put money into, we need to make sure that the companies that we do put money into have at least a chance of getting a 10 times return. And that would only make me breaking even roughly. So really, as an investor, when I'm looking at businesses, I want to see companies that have the the, the the possibility to do a 20, 30, 50, 100 times return in the future. Not now, not for a long time, 7, 10, 15 years, whatever. It's all good. But actually, ultimately, it's a company that has got a really big market, a really big opportunity. And fundamentally and, and, and crucially, it's got the team to really get in there as well. That's a really big thing. We asked a lot of our investors, you know, from all your exits and actually all your losses as well. What was the biggest driving forces to both a win or a loss, etc.? The number one choice across all of those from all investors was by far uh, the quality of the management team. That is what drive either a successful exit or an um, unsuccessful and unhappy demise. Um, 
So investors ultimately are looking for a really good team, a good founder who's got, who can inspire confidence, who really understands their industry, really understands the problem that the industry is facing and has a really good idea as to how to go about solving it. They won't have everything in place right now. They won't have, you know, all of the skill sets needed to take you all the way through to your 30 times return, but they'll have a lot of passion. They'll have a strong core understanding of the industry and they'll have a really good bit of, they'll probably have a little bit of commitment into the business itself, whether they put their own money into, whether their friends and family have got into the funding round as well, they'll, they'll be committed as well. So they're looking for that strong team, also a founder who can actually be a bit humble, can recognize some of the challenges, the, the, the I guess the gaps that they have in their own team as well. So that's some of the things that they're looking for. Another key thing investors are looking for is scalability. So scalability, what we really mean is the ability an offering that actually could be scaled quite vastly, fairly cheaply. It doesn't require lots of money. So things like retail can be really hard because it's hard to scale a retail outlet. It's really hard to do that. It's expensive to do that. You know, services that are human led services are often really hard, like consultancy. They're not particularly scalable because you need lots of people to deliver it. But things like software, software as a service, they're very, very scalable technology, deep technology can be scalable massively if you license it out. So there are some ways that actually really, you know, they wanna see something that can go really big and has the facility to do that and won't need a massive amount of money to get it there. So big things like infrastructure aren't very attractive to angels because they're hard to scale. The other thing, the final thing really to think about the three key standouts is market fit. So product market fit. So what we mean by that really is indicators, some indicators that the product, the service, the solution that you as a founder have the market really kind of think, you know what, this is really useful. So actually showing that you're genuinely solving an actual pain point or problem, or you're genuinely really improving something by a significant master, by a significant margin to justify them coming to you as a customer and wanting to kind of buy your product, buy your service. So they want to see that. Um, and the way you prove that product market fit really is actually quite straightforward through a little bit of demonstrable commercial traction. And that's what angels will typically want to see. They want to see some level of traction and it could be it doesn't have to be cold hard sales it could be someone from the industry joining your advisory board it could be someone from the industry making a small investment it could be you've been accepted onto an accelerator program an industry specific accelerator program which is led by experts in the field have selected your business that's a good sign it could be pilots it could be pre-sales it could be really strong conversations it could be quotes it could be letters of intent anything that points that someone independent of you your friends and your family independent but very much uh, 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 experience within the industry that you're, you're you're intending to operate has looked at what you're doing and said you know what this is interesting this is actually going to make a difference people are going to want this yeah i like this and back this in some way so that's a really key thing if you don't yet have that you're going to really struggle to get any angel investment to get angels interested and, and engaged it's why often you're told to, to to use friends and family use your own resources beg borrow steal to get your minimum viable product your mvp done so you can get some of these early proof points because you use those to get your your first external funding round which is from angels another key thing to think about and i mentioned about this this angel piece about wanting to get an actual return on our investment and that's to see founders who have a viable sensible exit strategy so you're actually thinking about how you're going to get an exit potentially. You're actually thinking about that. And, and as, a, as an investor, I will not make anything, even if your business does really well, unless someone buys a company, buys a business, or maybe you do an IPO and you float, which is very, very rare, but actually does happen sometimes. Um, so what we want to see is a company that we think is going to be, you know what, if you grow to a certain size, some of these big corporates are going, are going to want to either, are going to want to buy you just to get rid of you because you're being really annoying or buy you and absorb you so they can kind of broaden their own service set or you know buy you because they can see actually fundamentally this is a really cash rich business it's really exciting let's do this um so ultimately they want to see as an investor something that they feel has the potential to actually create an exit not just grow 30 times the size but actually get me an exit as an investor because that's really crucial so assuming you've been through that and you haven't been completely put off from going for our angel investing um i want to talk a little bit more about now who are the investors out there so um uh, this here again got a good graph uh, my graphs are super simple though if i'm pretty honest i'm going to kind of explain what i want to talk a bit about is your founder's journey and kind of how that kind of interlinks and relates to um, the investing piece. So hopefully you can see my mouse on the screen if you can at the very beginning here you've got this kind of this is you you've had your idea right this is your revenue line this 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 little line here, you've had your idea, you're gonna kind of starting to kind of get a bit of, you're, you're spending money now, so revenue cash is going out, you're, you're building out your product, your MVP, 
you've got your product at MVP, you're starting to get a bit, you're still spending money, you're getting some validation, you might get a little bit of early, you might get a little bit of early, um, a little bit of early uh, revenue and income, you're starting to get more, it's picking up a bit more, you then can actively scale it and off you go into the future, making lots of money, growing, you've got that kind of traditional bell curve as thing that taps out after seven, 10 years, that kind of thing, and off you go. So what I want to do, if that's your journey as a founder, actually, I have, I should stretch this, this whole phase takes two or three years, this phase takes about three years, this phase is about three years, roughly as well, all in. So um, I probably should stretch this graph out a little bit, I'll change it another time. But um, what I wanted to do was just to tell you, so who are the investors out there for you, given where you're tracking as a, as a business? And hopefully this will give you a bit of an understanding. So first of all, friends and family are your first go to option for investing. Um, because you haven't yet got any proof points that what you're doing isn't completely mad, you, can, you have to rely on friends and family, you know, debt, look, anything you can hustle, grants, that kind of early funding piece to get to get enough money to build something that you can then prove out to investors. Once you've got some validation, angels will become interested. So they'll typically invest anything. Oh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but angels will then become interested right the way through to you actually scaling and turning over. You then get into early stage VC and then later stage VC. So the early stage VC, this is kind of right here is your series A funding round is what it's called. So this is your round, your angel rounds, typically one to five rounds. So if you are actually going through the high growth phase and you're going to do an angel round and go for equity, there's going to be three, four, five rounds of funding before you get to like a big chunky 10 million pound series A. And just for those of you out there who are interested in thinking, oh, I'm going for this VC money, really, you need to be turning over about two million quid a year. Normally a million quid has actually gone up about two million pounds per annum. They want to see roughly tracking. Um, so what's that? 180 grand a month of, of annual recurring of uh, ARR. That's what they want to see. Um, before you can start to really engage with the VC industry. So they want to see a company that's actually already trading, already flying, doing pretty well. If you're in a deep technology business, it's like a really you know, kind of expensive, capital intensive, deep technology, knowledge intensive, it's a little bit different. Um, they are going to want to see, but they are going to want to see some really strong commercial interest. Because ultimately, in that kind of space, normally customers can be really big value, and you just take one customer, and you're already doing five million. But actually, what they want to see is that really early, quite a lot of early commercial engagement. So you're still not dissimilar. You have to be at a pretty advanced stage to typically attract VC. There are quite a lot of cool VCs who are putting money in at angel stages as well, who are going in early, but they're not the norm. And I'm going to explain a bit more about the stats and the numbers around it because a lot of people have heard of VCs. Uh, and venture capital, et cetera, et cetera. But not a lot of people have heard of angels. But what you'll notice is that this whole latest state, all this kind of unicorn creation, all this kind of hyper wealth, success, growth, yeah. excitement, all the press, all the money being made, all the wonderful stuff, it all starts, it all starts down here. Um, and that's up generally with friends and family and angels and early stage VC. Without kind of angel funding, it's this whole piece up here, which is where all the glory is, doesn't exist. Um, so the government is very, very conscious of that. And I'm going to explain a little bit more in a minute as to what they're doing about it too. Um, just for those for a little terminology piece, terminology can be really challenging. Um, Series A is officially your first institutional funding round. So it's your first meaningful institutional funding round. So it, when an institution, i.e. a venture capital investment fund of any structure whatsoever, writes a check of around 2 million plus, that's probably regarded as your Series A. Um, and then your Series B is your second one, your Series C is your third one, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to explain that. And another one is, you hear like seed, pre-seed. Um, it's, a, in, in my view, I've seen the definition of pre-seed and seed shift and move over the last 10 years. Also, if you're from the States or in the States, it's all very different. All of this is pre-seed in the States. Um, but anyway, um, in the UK, pre-seed referred to is up to that kind of really early traction angel round. Seed is that kind of post-traction. You've got some customers and you're starting to move. That's your seed round as you move on. I just wanted to kind of let you know. And then you get into venture and then you get up to growth up here as well, just to let you kind of know. Bit of fun. So what's the government doing about this? Let's say, yes, angels are super important. You have to get some angel investing into your business to, to grow and scale, especially if you're knowledge intensive, especially if you're highly innovative. Um, so what are they going to do about to try and stimulate as much investment going on? Well, they've done a... They've done a lot, actually. And actually, the UK is one of the best places on the planet to start a business, which is phenomenal. And that's through independent world rankings. We're up there, I think we're number three in the world behind like New York and behind like the Valley, etc., which is pretty good, given how small we are. Um, and a lot of that's driven largely by our kind of very active angel scene. 
um, at those early stages. So it's been driven predominantly, in my view, by the Enterprise Investment Scheme and the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, which is a government-backed scheme whereby it gives investors, if I invest in your business, it gives me a massive tax break. So if I put 100 big ones into your company, I can get half of it off my income tax. So I'm actually, I've got 100 grand worth of shares, but I've only paid 50 grand for it. Fantastic. And actually, if you succeed and you do really well and you, after three, five, 10 years, you smash it, exit, make me loads and loads of money, we, um, I pay no capital gains tax. Capital gains tax is a stinger, I can assure you. So it's a really, really good incentive. EIS is for more developed companies where you can raise a lot more, et cetera. Um, it's a bit different, so it's really interesting. Um, it's well worth, EIS and SEIS are fundamentally uh, a crucial part of what we do. Just to give you a kind of numbers, 36,000 individual people invest 2.5 billion pounds last year. Uh, so it's big, right? It's a lot of money at early stages, which is kind of cool. Another thing they're doing is around co-investment funds. So I've recognized, so um, the BBB have been really, really active in co-investment funds. Um, the regional co-funds, we're not terribly well served for regional co-funds because, we're, again, we're southeast, right? So we're not with London, so we're not a problem. Um, but there are like Southwest Investment Fund. There's also, for those of you dialing in for a bit further afield, there are other regional funds out there as well. There is also the Regional Angels Programme, which is a programme, again, funded by BBB to hundreds of millions of pounds, where they're putting money in alongside angel groups to give them more firepower. Um, which is really interesting. So they're also accessible. So groups like um, Startup Funding Club, SFC Capital, known as um, Green Angel Syndicate. There's quite a few of them. Pre Turin have some deep bridge. There's loads of, um, I think 24 Hay Market might have some of that money as well. There's quite a lot of them um, that have access to that cash too. So um, they're doing an awful lot. They're pumping a lot of money in behind this, which is really exciting. Um, the realities of equity. So I talked a bit about VCs and et cetera. Um, um, and I wanted to just kind of make a little bit of a, uh, just get across. I looked at all VC investments at both, you know, seed stage companies, and I looked at all VC investments at venture stage. I did it to the 2000, the 21, 2020, 2021 tax year because it was easy. Um, uh, I looked at those and just wanted to kind of explain that VCs are fantastic. They are highly selective. They only invest in the things that they really like and really tick to them, and they put a lot of time and effort into them. So if you can get VC funding, then great. But if you're at the earlier stages, the vast majority of capital and numbers of investments being made out there comes through angels, it comes through EIS funds, SEIS funds, that's where it's coming from. In that same period, VCs invested in collectively at seed stages, so that seed stage I showed, in about 260 companies against 2,000 companies by SEIS. That's a big difference. And at that kind of uh, venture stage, which is that EIS piece, um, 3,755 against 469 investments made by VCs at venture stage according to Bohurst from this side, and according to HMRC on this side. Um, there'll be some disparities. Bohurst can only track, you know, a certain proportion of the deals. This tracks all of the deals because they're actually nailing the data from a government perspective. So there'll be some slight disparities. But what is clear is it's 7,000 versus 700. So it's 10 times the number of companies really are being supported by this. So just wanted to kind of make that clear for you guys so you can get a feel for it. Um, another big challenge that we've talked about is two thirds of the UK's equity investment goes into London based businesses. That's London based, not London in the southeast, London based businesses. We can make that clear as well. Oxford, Cambridge, London Triangle have a great time, but everywhere outside of it, this southeast piece, which I'm sitting in here, actually, it's probably even better for CM25 and all of it, isn't it? I'm sitting about here right now, um, is it doesn't really see that level of activity, um, um, even though the wealth, there's a lot of wealth down here as well, to be fair. So look, funding sources and how they work, I wanted to track a little bit for you guys to talk a bit about, I've talked, I've referenced angels, I've referenced VCs, I'm going to talk a bit more about VCs, maybe a little bit, a bit more about the different types of, um, a little bit more about the different other forms of funding that are out there and whether they could be relevant for you as well. Uh, I'm going to just kind of rattle through this um, and just double check my timing for the rest of it because I am keen to get in as much as I can uh, for you guys. So different sources. Here are some key sources. These are non-angel sources. And I'm going to get a bit more into angels so you can get a bit of a feel for it. Uh, but ultimately, here are the kind of key sources of funding for early stage businesses that I see. So first of all, crowdfunding. So that's like equity crowdfunding we're talking about here, not like um, the other one, the one that you can kind of like pre-launch your products, et cetera. Um, ultimately, this is what I'm talking about, is equity crowdfunding specifically. So 
what we've got, um, uh, that's Crowdcube, Cedars, Thunderbeam, they're all members of ours. We've been working with them for many years. We'll talk a bit about, you know, how that, whether that's relevant for you guys, the, the pros, the cons attached to it as well. I'll talk a little bit more about venture capital. I've covered it quite a bit. I'm going to talk a bit about debt and loan and the, uh, and the extent to which it probably isn't relevant for you. And I'll talk a bit about grants as well. So let's crack on and go fast. Crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, what is it? Fundamentally, you're raising from the public almost. Um, yes, they are high net worth or sophisticated investors are meant to be. There are some retail investors knocking about in there. Um, you've got to think about it. If you want to raise some money, you're raising it from the public. So it's going to be a business that the public can engage with. So things like uh, deep technologies ain't going to cut it because Joe Public doesn't get it. They won't see the opportunity. B2B stuff doesn't really engage. It does occasionally. Some, you know, if it's got like an environmental angle or it's got, a, you know, some, so they've managed to weave some level of sex appeal into it by being something really cool attached to cars. But in reality, it's something like brewery, it's food products, it's businesses, it's, it's, it's things that you can really use to engage um, people. So if you've got a B2C or a consumer offering, it's really, really fantastic. So like Go Henry did it, Grind did it. You know, they're all fantastic family, raised a lot of money through the process. Another key thing um, is that they are the crowdfunding platforms. Typically, they want to see that you've already got some investment lined up before they'll add you, because otherwise they just have lots and lots of empty deals. So they use that as a way of making sure you're, you know, you've got some traction. You are an exciting proposition. So typically, you won't even get listed on these platforms unless you've got at least a half, maybe even two thirds of your round already lined up from, you know, from from investors and you can guess that where they where those investors come from probably angels and a good thing about crowdfunding really that i see as well if you've got a customer base you can raise money from them um also you can find actually you can find really good angels on there as well some angels do actually invest by the crowdfunding platform which is quite cool so you can pick up some good people um but remember they're a platform for making an investment happen not necessarily a source of funding so yes they have a lot of investors there but um, when you do a funding campaign, first of all, half of it you're going to have ready already from yourself. And then you kind of you'll typically get a quarter of it coming from their platform who are already there. And the other quarter comes from you marketing, video, sharing, convincing your community. So it's not for everyone. It's definitely for those who've already got a really strong commercial following and doing more stuff that are aligned with kind of consumer interests as well. So just want to shout that out. Venture Capital, I've talked a bit about their activity levels at this stage, is whereby they do, they are active, but it's not the norm. So just be conscious of that um they only invest in four maybe 10 companies a year some absolutely go against that grain like startup funding club they did about 70 i think in one year um but it's not the norm really um they typically want a shorter time horizon so they can make um so that they can make their return on investment and because the cost of doing lots of due diligence and the legals of doing a bigger deal they tend to invest bigger amounts which means they invest at later stages um, and vcs as they grow up they tend to invest in companies as they get older and older so they, they're kind of de-risking a little bit by only going into the companies that are just starting to scale and go massive that's when they invest and go in there they help them to really accelerate and go and make an exit in three five ten you know three, three to five years they're looking for their exit horizons so they're a bit different but they are massively value added if you get them if you need them then fantastic um but um they are not always the right port of call or relevant really for you if you're at early stages um, as mentioned uh, recommend a reading go forth and buy venture deals by um by brad feld he's a he's an active angel actually but one of the godfathers of venture in america he's a really good guy um, and he actually does some really cool stuff so read that book it's cheap and it's great um debt and loans typically for an age company they're not relevant for you as a as a company you can't service a loan normally um there are very little loans available there are some um innovation loans kind of venture loans that are out there as well um, and actually, again, funded by BEV. There's also, if you haven't heard about it already, startup loans, which are very good, 25 grand per director. So I think you can get up to 100 grand for a company. Uh, and it's like 6%, it's quite cheap, which is really good. It's, it is personal guarantee. So you actually, again, it's a personal loan. It's not really for the business at all, really. So bear that in mind. Grants is another key source of funding and a really important source of funding because you don't get diluted, you don't have to pay it back. It's just a nice lump of cash from the government. Innovate UK are phenomenal. They dish out over a billion quid a year into um, you know high growth, innovation rich businesses, kind of advance innovation, advance their research, and really really kind of like get, get, hopefully get them close to market as well. So they're phenomenal, and grants are really valuable. They are take a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of work to actually win them. There's a high death rate in terms of companies not successfully winning the grant, having put a lot of time into trying to get it. The other thing about grants is are a match. You've got to match fund them. And so you've got to, you've got to get a match. And so where are you going to get, where are you going to match it to? You guessed it. 
angels. So you've got to find some angels. So if you want to go on a platform, you've got to get some angels before you go on a platform. If you want to get some grants, you've got to match it alongside some, some angels. If you want to get some co-investment funds from a, a regional co-fund, this match, you've got to match it alongside some angels. So angels are important to funding if you're early stages. So what is a business angel? Let's dive into this. I think I've got about 10 minutes left to cover, so we're going to rattle on. Um, an angel is an individual, just like anyone in, let's see, in this room, which would just be me, but in the audience, they are someone who is, um, you know, you are, a, a, you could be a, a sophisticated, wealthy, you know, you've got some money sitting on the side. You, you, you might have started a company, grown a company, exited it, and made a lot of money and wanted to give back. So you've got a lot of experience, but actually you might just be in services. You might be doing other things and just have a bit of spare cash and just be a bit passionate. An angel, fundamentally, they are investing their own hard-earned cash directly into a business themselves. So what they are doing is you as a founder, they're going, you know what? I really like what you're doing. There's a one in, there's only a one in 10 chance that you're actually going to make me any money back whatsoever. In fact, you know, there's an eight or nine in 10 chance and I'm going to lose my money and giving it to you. Um, that's not, even if I do make some money, I'm only going to make it in seven to 10 years, maybe. Um, but I really like your passion. I like what you're doing. I like, uh, I like your approach. I love what you're trying to achieve. I believe in you. I trust you. So here's, you know, 20,000 pounds of my hard earned cash. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why they are called business angels and not dragons. So this is the whole thing. You know, there's about 36,000 of these darlings out there and they are supporting some phenomenal businesses by not just giving them money, but also supporting them with advice, with guidance, with introductions. If there's something that they really can get passionate about, they might even roll their sleeves up and get involved a bit more as well. So that's an angel, typically. An individual, writing their own money, writing their own checks. They invest normally between 20 to 40,000 pounds is the average ticket size per investor, per deal. So if you're there thinking, oh, I need about 200 grand, or I need half a million thousand pounds, yeah, I need half a million, um, and you're doing the maths, you've worked out that you need at least 10, 20 angels in your uh, round to make that work if they're only writing 20 to 50 grand checks. Well, you'd be right, uh, which is quite challenging. So you've got to herd a lot of cats. You've got to engage with a lot of people to fill up an angel round. It's not just like you make meet one or two angels and they do the full lot. Those days are long gone. Um, it does happen, but it's very, very rare. Um, they do, fortunately, often join and invest as part of an angel group as part of a group so and they do that because when you come together as an angels you can kind of share due diligence you can share the skills when, they, when they're interviewing you and deciding they want to invest in you you know there'd be more of them to kind of look at your business look at your market just before they do it also they share deal flow together so if you approach one angel they'll bring in other angels and, and other angels if they see one good deal they'll bring in their friends around it so they can kind of really have a look and and share the deal flow but also when there's more of them together there's more capital, there's more support, they can do more to help a founder, they can put more money in because there's 10 of them rather than just one. So they often form groups or, or, or are members of groups or multiple groups, actually. They're quite, uh, you know, they are a little bit nomadic sometimes. Um, there are um, there are over 100 angel groups as members of UKBAA. So there's a lot out there. Um, in the Southeast, you've got Southeast Angels, they've got, um, you've got Surrey Investors Club, which is based kind of merged between um, 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 Angels 5K and uh, they kind of merged together to form a, a kind of a new one. You've got a new one being formed down in Brighton, which is really cool, so attached to Sussex Innovation Centre. You've obviously got Angels at Essex, the most amazing angel uh, existence known to man as well. Uh, I think John's going to be joining us later, so his ears would be burning and waiting to hear me say that. So you've got a few groups down here. There's all the S100 attached to the Guildford University. There's also a bit of angel activity happening in Southampton around future worlds. There are some angel, there are some angel activity happening across the southeast. You've obviously got the kind of Oxford angels of the world. You go into that kind of more Thames Valley world outside of London, you know, that wraparound too. Um, and then you kind of, you know, you kind of breeze into to heading towards um, other parts of the country too. But um, so you do have some angel groups down here. There aren't huge numbers compared to how many founders there probably are, but they are worth approaching and, and, and having a having a go at as well. Fundamentally. What I wanted to really convey with this lovely slide of stones is that leveraging as many different sources of finance and funding for your business is crucial to maximizing your chances of not running out of cash. So you really should be tapping into grants. You should be looking at debt if it's relevant for you guys and you can get it. You should be looking at angels. You should be looking at VCs. You should be looking at co-funds. You should be literally, you know, R&D tax credits. You should be going for that if you can. You should be doing everything you can to kind of bring it all together. One thing we've realized is that angels typically tend to be that kind of, they're the stone, 
mean, if you get that angel money, you can really bring in the other form of funding. It unlocks the grants as a match. It brings in co-funding. It can kind of bring in, you can match it against r and tax credits as well. So it really is the most leverageable piece. It's called the hurt money. Angel investors is called the hurt money or the hard money. Once you get that in place, it can really unlock a lot more potential cash out there as well for you. So just bear that in mind. And I just wanted to kind of make that clear that you should be really thinking about that. So we're coming towards the end. I think I've actually even got five minutes spare and great. So I was going to go through my last slide really, really slowly uh, just to make up the time so we don't mess up the time for all the other panelists coming up after me. Um, a simple list. I want to chat through now, you know, where can you go and find these, these angels hidden among grass out there? There's 36,000 of them out there somewhere hiding. They are very much hiding below the radar. We reckon via our angel group members, we can get to about 17,000 of them, which is only about half. So it's they're hard to find, I'll tell you. Um, where are they out there? So I wanted to kind of, if let's say you've got, you know, you, you think you're going to be a high growth business, you are excited, you're using your stuff, you've looked at, you're not put off so far with what I've said. You think you know how to go out and raise some funding, which is, I was going to talk a little bit about um, um, what you need to do to get ready for investment. So things like making sure you've got a really good investment debt, like a sales brochure. If you think you're ready enough and you want to go start raising money, my big tip to you all is to treat this like a sales process. So make sure you've got really, really, really clean, crisp documents, like a good deck, a really good documents that actually are going to be engaged in like a good brochure. Make sure you're actually really thinking about your sales targets. Like who are the investors that could be relevant for you? Which VCs could be relevant for you if you are at a certain stage? Who should you be kind of um, looking at? And actually treating, having a list of them and working them through the process because you've got to get... 20 of them to agree to invest in you to fill your funding round, you, you should treat this like a sales process and really go for it. Um, so if you think you're at that stage and you're going to get to that stage, here are some good places to have a little look. You can screenshot this. You can take photos of it if you want. It's useful. First of all, the BBB Finance Hub. They have uh, the BBB's have a finance hub where you can actually put in some details about what you're looking for, who you are, and it'll give you an idea as to the kind of types of funding that you could be relevant for, which is useful. And um, more often than not, if you're at that angel stage, they'll just point you back to us. So um, because we're their kind of key partners there, and so you'll be appointed to ukba.org.uk. It's a good resource. We don't charge founders anything. We don't, we've got we get about six thousand founders come to us every single month, I reckon, roughly. So there's a lot of founders coming towards us for support. We've got some educational pages which we're going to probably update over the next kind of six to twelve months as well, make it better for you guys. We've also got the membership directory, which is free and it's open. So you can, if you log in, subscribe so that we can spam you. You can browse all of our members and actually approach them through the platform. But I wouldn't go forth and spam. I would use it as a research tool to build up your sales list and make really good approaches to investors. So just be cautious. Don't be slapdash. Don't just smash emails out there. Because you'll get no, you'll get, you'll get zero replies. So just make sure you do a really carefully thought through approach. Um, also, another good resource is shipshape.vc. Um, a lad called Daniel Sorco, very bright, really nice lad. Um, um, set up ShipShape, which basically scrapes the internet for um, investments that have happened and actually puts it in a database, which he allows people to access for free if you log in and subscribe so that he can spam you too. Um, uh, you can search, but the key thing about ShipShape, which I really like, is that you can do keyword search. So if you're doing something like, I don't know, uh, got a new battery technology, you could keyword search for battery. Or if you've got like a new, I don't know, you've gone for sodium as opposed to lithium, you can do sodium battery and it will show any deals that have happened, any investors behind any companies that that that, that match that keyword search for sodium battery. So it's quite, it's quite powerful, actually. Um, also, your own professional and personal network. You probably do. If you know, if you've, if you've been in business or been in some kind of professional career for a bit of time, through that time, you would have met, greeted and come across people that may well be able to invest in you and back you, who trust you and support and would like to support you. So do think about your own network. Um, have a think about that because, you know, you'd be surprised who could potentially invest now. You know, your old boss. I actually have heard quite a lot of founders who got money from their old boss because their old boss has got a bit of money and their old boss really quite, you know, like them and you know, she decides to put some money into them. So fantastic. Um, also events. So investment and industry events. There's plenty of events that happen around the country. There's loads happening in London as well in particular. So in the southeast, it's quite easy to get in there. On our website, we list lots and lots of events as well, including good events that people like Angel at, 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 at Essex and others as well operate and hold. So do check those out. Take a look at Crunchbase. That's another free resource that you can go to to um, find investors. Um, 
that's a uh, just google it and have a look at it the bvca handbook so the bvca um you have to pay for it and it, they charge a couple hundred quid but they have all their vc members of which they've got hundreds you can actually search for them as well and get their details and reach out to them so you could look at that but only if you're really at vc stage and you've got to pay like two or three hundred quid linkedin and google do some searching and research. Google, search for angels, search for just do some searching around your industry. Search on LinkedIn for angels. Be slight caution. If people who are really, really kind of openly promoting that they're an angel and consultant, they're actually probably a consultant. You should be cautious about that. We see quite a few of that. Um, but actually, there are quite some good angels who are quite active on LinkedIn and very open about it as well. So take a look at that. Also, if you are early stage, they're very early, then think about joining an accelerator. Think about approaching Innovate UK Edge. They can be really helpful in not only getting you kind of investment ready and helping you with your documentation, but if you're joining an accelerator, they can help you finding industry mentors. And actually, the due demo days can help you find some investment as well. So they can be really helpful. Um, I told you I'd spend five minutes and take my time on this slide to bring me exactly to time, and I think I've done it. So that is my last slide, and thank you, everyone, for, for, for listening in, and I hope I wasn't too fast. Rod, thank you very much. Um, I don't underestimate how difficult it was to cram so much information into such a short space of time. It's I think fast. One, yeah, <laughs> the one thing I'd want to get across is that you know today's session isn't isn't there to answer absolutely every single question. It's about peaking interest. It's about getting people engaged with the type of funding that we're, we're talking about today. It's great to see that we've got some questions coming through from the attendees, which most of which will will park until the Q and A session. But one very quick one, Rod, is a question about where can I find angel investors and angel networks in other parts of the UK, and specifically was talking around um, the North and Sheffield. Same, um, same answer applies. So uh, we're a national trade association, not just for the southeast. So have a look nationally uh, for the northeast, for Sheffield, not as not massively well. Actually, there's things like angel groups are really good. So they're actually called angel groups, which is very. Uh, there's um, North Invest up there, GC Angels doing some good stuff up there. Um, there are some up there. You can have a look and have a research. There are they are active up there. It's a bit. It's a little bit thinner, um, but it's still pretty. The groups that are there are actually pretty well developed in my view. So yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, some of the programs that the bank have supported are definitely prevalent and active up in that part of the world. So we can definitely pick that up. Rod, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you again shortly uh, for the panel session. Um, for the for our next speaker, we're really lucky to have uh, a CEO and founder of an innovative business in Ben, who's going to be speaking to us uh, very shortly. Um, ben, you're very welcome. I think we've heard from an investor and where the cash is coming from perspective. What I'd really like you to, to talk us through for the next few minutes is give us some background on your business, but then also talk through your journey, if you like, in terms of raising funding and finance. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think Rod's laid the groundwork for me very, very well here. So I appreciate, uh, appreciate that, Rod. It's, a, it's definitely a challenging piece to, to, to go through that in detail and, and to pinpoint everything. So hopefully I can bring it to life even more now as a business uh, living that experience. Um, so thank you. I am uh, Ben, CEO and founder of Rama Karma. Uh, we are a monthly insurance subscription. Um, effectively, our funding journey, we have raised over £2 million from multiple different sources. Uh, and I'm speaking to you today about how we've kind of gone through that process, uh, the challenges, the trials, the tribulations uh, of that. So uh, hopefully I can bring it to life. Um, just to, to start things off, to explain kind of who we are, um, as a monthly insurance subscription, um, we were set up originally. Uh, I worked in the city of London as an insurance broker for 10 years. Um, I also was a renter for those 10 years, but never once did I buy content insurance. To me, that was a pretty major red flag. Um, so I went about with my co-founder, Chris, setting up a subscription, a simple monthly subscription to address that in a different way. Simply pick one to five items and have protection for those items wherever you go inside, outside and abroad. Um, so just to bring our story to life a bit more, uh, let me get the next slide. Fantastic. Um, so our journey so far, um, we established back in 2019. Um, since then, it's been an absolutely, absolute whirlwind, uh, a huge roller coaster of emotion, uh, as, as many founders can attest to. Uh, just judging from last year to this year, we've had 450% growth. Uh, we've secured a huge game-changing corporate partner in Gallagher um, who are a multi-billion revenue uh, broker um, globally. We've, we are capturing a generation into insurance 
better than anyone else in the market right now. Uh, and that generation really is that 18 to 30 bracket. We are a B Corp certified uh, business, hence the Karma and Armor Karma. So, two, uh, so, so, so um, effectively, uh, alongside likes of Ben and Jerry's and Patty Case and Fantasy, Fantasy Brands, we're a force for good, um, which is which is great. Um, we are also backed by Seed VC of the Year, uh, Ascension Ventures. They actually led our seed round in Q4 of last year, uh, which I will speak a bit more about uh, later down the line. And that was through their Fair by Design Fund. Uh, and last but not least, uh, you can probably see part of it through uh, under my camera, but we are a winning team. We've had over 20 industry awards and nominations, uh, including a gratefully young achiever of the year last year for myself at British Insurance Awards. And then just a couple of days ago, we had um, uh, we were listed in, in Shortech 50 um, by Business Cloud. As I said, uh, as a founding team, it's myself and Chris. We met at university, um, like many um, founding teams before, uh, we went our separate ways. Chris went into banking, I went into insurance, and we we, we met up and, and set this up. Uh, and we're backed by a fantastic board. In terms of traction, uh, Rod mentioned this a little bit in terms of journeys of where people sit on the fundraising scale. Um, we have thousands of subscribers, paying subscribers on a monthly basis now, um, which definitely was not the case back in 2019, 2020, or even 2021. So um, things have definitely picked up in, in a fantastic way. Um, but this hopefully lays the groundwork and a bit of a background to us. Um, to talk about the challenges that we've had on the, along that way from a fundraising perspective. Um, so I mentioned that we had raised over two million pounds from 2019. Um, what that doesn't really tie into and what the slides before this hasn't tied into is the blood, sweat and tears that it took to get to that stage. Um, you know, finding and sealing investment is a huge challenge for every founder. Um, naturally, every founding and team and every startup's journey is different so um something that i may say may resonate some it may not um so you know establishing um investment leads is a really key piece in that uh rod's obviously gone into this in great detail about how to find those leads um but what can be a real challenge and something we faced uh, is spending a lot of time on certain leads uh, for them to either amount to a very, very, very small investment or nothing at all. Uh, and then we've had others where we spent very little time on uh, nurturing that lead and they've come out to be some of the biggest investment ticket sizes we've had. So uh, definitely a piece of advice there, finding the right leads, analyzing them and working out kind of whether or not they're going to be strong leads for you is very, very important. Um, one of the key challenges we've had uh, is having a plan B, C and D um, we've had on multiple occasions in many different rounds. So we've done three official funding rounds to date. So what we've seen is a pre-seed, um, a convertible note or a bridge, and then a seed round. Um, we're also uh, undergoing a current uh, bridge round on top of that. So our fourth kind of round. Um, what we've had at pretty much every single stage is an investor committing uh, and then the 11th hour um, not following through with investments. Uh, and really leaving us in, in a difficult position. So um, something to be aware of and something that we've had as a challenge is ensuring that we have a plan B, C and D because you never know until the funds are in the bank account whether or not the uh, investment is going to go through uh, in, in a timely manner, which is always a challenge for founders and startups because uh, we are all obviously very cash flow sensitive. Um, one other challenge is timing. It, don't leave it too late. Um, naturally, you want to wait until you're ready to raise investment. Um, but I think in most cases, and it has for us in every single case, taken probably twice the amount of time um, to raise and complete on a round as we had expected. Um, so naturally, we've learned from that going forward, um, but it's just something to be aware of. Going into the advice, which I think is a bit more important, um, this is probably the, the longest piece. So just one thing for founders show passion and excitement and um, for your business i've been on many many pitch events alongside other businesses and founders where the excitement hasn't been there the passion hasn't been there and naturally they haven't done as well as they had hoped on these pitch events because they they don't get excited about their business and then they can't pass that excitement on um to uh, the investors another key piece of advice um, and something rod mentioned at an early stage don't be afraid to utilize those close networks 
friends, families, and especially professional networks. So for me, that was a really big piece. Um, I raised um, quite a bit of early cash from uh, previous clients or people I've dealt with before, um, ex-bosses uh, and people connected to those individuals. And the SEIS, we filled very, very quickly in the pre-seed round, uh, and we're very much into our EIS uh, now with those individuals. Um, the one takeaway, the one massive takeaway from an advice piece from me uh, on this is be persistent, but not annoying. Uh, if that's one thing that you can take away from my talk today, that's that's the biggest piece. Um, what I mean by that is build these uh, connections, build these leads, nurture them, uh, keep them updated of your progress the whole way through the journey because progress beats pitch every time. Much of the investors we have in the rounds now, I've been speaking to for over two years uh, along this journey, and they haven't. They've said we haven't been right at those stages, but we're right now because we've hit the marks. We've done what we said we were going to do. Uh, and, and we've, we've beat um, the, the, the targets we set ourselves. Um, so I kind of um, really want you to take away that, uh, that piece there. Be persistent but annoying because progress beats pitch every time. Um, and that includes one I've actually, a pitch I've got later today with a European angel group, um, which is another source of investment. Um, don't be afraid to, to invest. Uh, don't be afraid to raise from outside of the UK because it is very much possible. Um, and we are uh, pitching to a European angel syndicate um, to over 100 people um, this afternoon. So that's just an example of someone I've been speaking to for over two years. Um, also, another piece of advice is be creative. Um, we've been creative numerous times through our funding rounds, um, seeking with uh, partners uh, and uh, sweat equity um, to be able to kind of build them into the round. So, for example, if you are... Uh, partnering with a tech company on some form to provide something for you. Um, effectively, you can build them into the round by saying, okay, we will provide you 50K in sweat equity to pay for the next nine months worth of bills uh, and build that into the round if they have appetite and, and believe in the, the progress that you're making. So uh, we've been very, very creative numerous times in doing that. And it's really helped us build momentum, which is the next piece of advice. Build momentum because with momentum, um, comes a lot of traction um, from other investors. If you can show uh, excitement and build the momentum in the round, other investors will be um, thinking there's a feeding frenzy going on uh, and want to be involved because uh, without momentum, uh, angels will be asking themselves, why is no one else uh, picking up on this opportunity? Um, just a few last pieces of advice before I wrap up. Um, don't be scared to dilute. And um, this is a, ca a case with many founders uh, and many startup teams um, across the country. Um, naturally, 60% of a dead one is a dead company is worse than 40% of a thriving business. So um, if you are scared to dilute, don't be. It's important to, to, to build and grow your business and, and equity is a good way of doing that. There are obviously other ways, um, but really don't be, be fearful of diluting because it's a very smart way of pushing uh, and it's something that's really helped us along the way. Um, last but not least, um, something that Rod said, and I just want to add some flavor to it is, have good documents. Um, a pitch deck um, is a fantastic way of building uh, interest into a round. You know, naturally an angel or a VC will only look at these decks for um, less than a minute. So it's important to catch their attention and give them the key details. Uh, and then from there, um, you know, you can really build some, some key interest. Uh, as last but not least, on that good documentation, uh, building a data room is key. Um, it's something that I wish I would have done better at at the original days uh, in our fundraisers, but uh, building a data room where you store all the things that an investor could possibly want to see from projections to financials um, to certificates, anything that you could possibly provide into the data room um, significantly speeds up the process and allows you to get through the funding round far, far quicker. Great. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I think I've overrun slightly, but uh, maybe any questions if I'm allowed. I, I think there are some questions building in the in the chat, Ben, which we'll 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 pick up definitely with within the Q and A session. Um, yeah. And it's 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 really great to hear the, a real life example of how you've you've overcome some of those challenges. And there's definitely some questions coming in on there. So again, if you uh, come back and join us on the panel in a few minutes. Um, at this stage, I'd like to bring in our other two panelists. So first of all, um, 
John Stenhouse, who's the business support manager at the University of Essex. Now, John, your Angels at Essex platform was just at a very big trail from Rod during his session. So if I could ask you just to give us a little bit of background about how the platform came about and how the program works, generally the support that you guys give businesses that are in this situation of raising. Certainly, Paul, thank you for the introduction. And thank you, Rod, for uh, providing me with uh, a rather impressive start to Angels at Essex. Let, let me wind the clock back. Four years ago, it was just an idea. And with the help of the UK Business Angels Association, especially Rod Beer, and with the help of uh, very experienced investors and uh, VC fund managers, we came up with what we describe as a solution to a gap in the market. And three and a half years ago, we launched. Now, we are fully funded by the University of Essex. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the University of Essex is investing into businesses. We do not have a fund. We rely solely on the 150 plus investors that we have registered on our platform. And it is a platform. But the secret behind the platform is the fact that we provide one-to-one -one mentoring for those businesses that come to us that actually fit our criteria of what three things have you done before you come to us? Have you received grants? Have you received support? Have you been through an accelerator? What, what have you actually done? And is your idea highly innovative? In other words, market disruptive. So it's going to be difficult to place and not fit the norm. And are you B2B? Because B2C is probably better served in other areas to what we can provide. And the service we provide is actually free. So the University of Essex is funding the support that we provide. But as I say, we don't give out any money. And in the last three and a half years, I talk in cumulative figures rather than annual figures because it's a moving target. We have helped 500 businesses. That doesn't seem a vast number of businesses when you consider what, uh, how many investments there are going on. But out of those, only about just under 100 have actually made it to our platform. So in other words, they are the ones which we consider to be appropriate to our platform. But then another 20 odd we have actually helped and they've gone on to other platforms with our blessing because we're not charging for the service we want them to achieve. So you're looking at around about roughly just shy of 130 businesses have received some in-depth support from us over the last three and a half years. And they have themselves generated 50 million pounds worth of equity investment. And that has been verified by Bohurs, who actually track us now as an accelerator and the Scale Up Institute regard us as an accelerator as well, for which we are very proud because we didn't set out to be an accelerator, but everybody sees the outputs from what we achieve as being accelerating rapid growth in businesses. Those businesses that have received the 50 million are valued uh, just under 700 million in, in actual value. So the investments that are actually going to those businesses are significant, but they're not uh, over the top when it comes to investing in a business. So they're not giving away too much equity. And we've got some notable exceptions, but when it comes to the sectors, we're sector agnostic. So we are working with autonomous vehicles right the way through to creative and digital with insurance, Arma Karma was one of our friends uh, at the start. And we have seen some notable successes moving to Series A during the period that we've been working with them with very few failures. And when I say failures, we don't actually mean that businesses have failed. They just haven't succeeded in achieving what they set out to do. But we're there to help them throughout their journey. Um, we don't actually do Series A. We leave that to others and we often feel that you ought to be paying for professional support in the Series A area arena. But we have quite a few actually almost there now and working very steadily towards that. So the secret of our success is the fact that we help businesses. We actually help them become investment ready. 
but we're not here to help you start a business. And this is very important that you have actually done things before you get to us. And we are one of the biggest referrers to the UKRI Edge programme. But of course, there are limitations there with eligibility, revenue generating, that sort of thing. So we always look for alternatives that you can actually go to, whether that's a business support organization or another accelerator. And don't be fooled by the title Angels at Essex. Our, our angels are global. We have angels from all over the globe. They're not Essex alumni as such. There are a few, but they're not in the norm. And we cover businesses over the whole of the over the whole of England. So there's hardly a county in England that we do not have a business that we're working with. So that's where we are at. And if you want to follow us on LinkedIn, we are Angels at Essex at LinkedIn. So please follow us and uh, find out more that way. John, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much for that. And, uh, you know, really dovetails very well with everything we've heard so far. Um, I'd like to bring in our last panelist now, Fran Spooner. Now, there is an element of this transaction or this process um, from a founder and an investor perspective that's hugely important to get right. And, and Fran is a commercial lawyer with Marriott Harrison. So, Fran, can you come in and, and speak around really where you get involved, your profession, how important it is, and really what maybe sometimes what are the consequences of, of, of not doing things in the right way at this stage? Sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, it's been a really great session so far. Um, great to hear from all the speakers and the different aspects of um, investment rounds from different perspectives. Um, so, yeah, as Paul mentioned, I am... Um, I come in as a lawyer on the actual VC transaction, so quite different to anyone who's spoken already. Um, so I'm a partner in the corporate team at a law firm called Marriott Harrison. Um, also connected with John, um, we worked on a number of workshops with him, trying to educate some of the people in his network um, on legal matters relating to fundraising, which is really great. Um, we're also a member of the UK BAA, so we know Rod really well as well. Um, so within the corporate team at Merritt Harrison, I'm part specifically of the VC team, so venture capital team. So most of my time is spent on venture capital transactions, working either founder side for companies or investor side. Um, it kind of depends on the transaction and who instructs us. And because of our size, we can be fairly nimble. So relatively for a city of London law firm, we're considered quite small. We've got about 85 people, but that means we can be quite flexible. So we can work from pre-seed round as um, Rod described, you know, one of the terms for early stage fundraising, all the way through the different rounds to exit or less commonly IPO. Um, we are also sector agnostic, but we do tend to find being a VC focused team in London, um, a lot of our investors and a lot of the companies that come through are tech focused companies. Um, for instance, particularly at the moment, a lot of those companies tend to be tend to have some element of AI involved in their in their business and their company, which um, is just one of the kind of um, more popular things happening. And who knows where all that will go? Um, so alongside. Um, the corporate team and the VT, VC specialists, we also have a team of lawyers who work on everything that a company might need in between their different transactions. So you do a pre-seed round and then perhaps you're going to take on some employees. Um, so we have an employment team that would deal with that. We have a share schemes team that would deal with your EMI scheme for your employees. Um, we have a commercial team who deal with all of your commercial contracts and your IP and data protection, for instance. Um, so we're very we're very well set up and we have a good reputation in the tech startup company space. Um, and then specifically, Paul, your question about, you know, why is it important to actually have legal support? Why would someone come and speak to me and, and being honest, spend fees on getting advice from a lawyer? Um, obviously, I'm pretty biased. Um, I would say it's very important. Um, but obviously, like anything, um, any service that you pay for, you know, <laughs> ranging from plumbing to accountancy to law, we are experts in what we do. We do it day in, day out. We, we know how to run these deals. Um, so that gives you a level of um, expertise, knowledge, and sometimes most importantly, 
actually been able to highlight the things that aren't covered um, that might not be protected in the document. So you could look at, you could receive an investment document, you could look at it and think, oh, that looks okay, but there might be a whole load of things that aren't there that you'd want protected. Um, so we know the documents inside out and we can help you with that sort of thing. Um, it also helps align founders with investors because um, obviously investors also do these things day in, day out. They know the terms, they know market standards. They're kind of, in a way, they've kind of, the one step ahead of the founders because that's their day job. Um, so getting legal support on the founder side is important because it kind of brings you up to speed and you've got someone that you can pick up the phone and ask some questions about, you know, what does X term mean? Um, and also alongside that, we can provide, you know, market knowledge and, and help guide you on what's actually standard and what's not. And then finally, we can um, provide added value generally. Um, you know, as a VC team, we're very well connected. Um, you know, on the when we're working for investors or speaking with investors, we can actually help them with deal flow. So we get a good company and we can say, are you interested in this company? Equally for founders, we're very happy to make introductions to um, investors if it's appropriate, um, to different accountants who we work with closely, um, to tax experts, for instance. So, you know, I would say this, but we're just, we're useful people to know whether it's kind of on the legal work or whether it's more broadly. Brilliant. Thank you, Fran. Um, Given a really good overview there about why this is an important part of the process. Now, the questions are building, which is excellent. So if I can ask uh, John, Ben, and Rod to come back on onto camera, please, we can start to field some of the questions that are coming in from the audience and I'm building them or go, we'll go through them in the order that we've received them, to be fair. Um, so we've got a question from Rory that says, uh, do you have any ideas slash guides to help build a brochure to present to? So that's a pitch deck, really. So, yeah, I can answer that. Um, loads. There's loads of stuff on the Internet. You can access some of the some of the decks, actually, that have been used by the big unicorns like Uber, how they raise their money, Airbnb's original deck. There are loads of templates online. I think we've probably got one knocking about on our website, too. Um, it should be about 14, 15 pages. You should have two different decks, one for pitching over, which is lots of pretty pictures and about 10 slides, roughly, depending on how long you've got to pitch. You should have a handout deck as well, which is basically like a glory, basically that brochure I mentioned should be normally around 10 to 14 slides. And it's a story that really takes you through the problem, the solution, your technology, who the competitor, what the market size is, the size of the opportunity, who else is doing it. And it takes you through that process. So it's definitely available online as well. Ben, you might, I mean, how did you do yours? Did you find some good, did you get some good templates? Uh, I, I, I can tell you've got your stuff professionally designed because it looks pretty fresh. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. We actually have our in-house design, so I'll pass that uh, compliment right. on. Um, yeah, we, we've probably gone through, uh, I would say, 60 different pitch deck designs from the original days. Uh, every, whenever I want to pick me up, I always go back and look at the first pitch deck original. and <laughs> compare, it, compare it to the one we've done now, uh, and it's worlds apart. So what I say is the, the first one's not going to be perfect, but keep iterating it and don't be afraid to change it. Learn from it. Pick up on what uh, investors say to you saying i wish it had more about the competitive analysis or i wish it had more about your financials and traction take that advice uh, and if you're getting that advice numerous times definitely implement that advice into your pitch deck even mid-round do not be afraid to make those tweaks your pitch deck and adapt uh, and build on it and, 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 and make sure it's the, the best version it can be John, can I just jump in there? Yeah, oh, of course. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, because as, as well as having my lawyer hat on, I have also um, tentatively dipped my toe in the water of angel investing. Um, very small amounts, just got started. But if that helps anyone, you know, you don't have to have, as Rod said, you don't have to have uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds sitting around. Um, but one thing I would say from the angel investor perspective is actually sometimes you just want to know what the business is in like 60 seconds or one slide and one of the problems is obviously when you're so embedded in the company and you know everything about it you can you could talk for hours about it probably and it would be amazing and passionate but actually all you want is like a very quick snapshot of being like what is it what problem is there what are you solving and how can i help you um, so I think it's important to kind of have that as well in the back of your mind or as a slide, you know, like an executive summary or something, just being like, you can just look at that slide, get to grips with it and kind of move on and say yes or no. Brilliant. Thanks, Ryan. John, from your perspective, you probably see a lot of pitch decks. 
any sort of key yes, themes so as a, a do or a don't that uh, might help the audience? Yes, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I would say I, I agree that uh, you're looking at around about 15 slides plus or minus three, but the slides have got to be simple. They've got to be clear, a f as few as words as possible, but very succinct. So the words, every word counts. And it is, okay, if it's innovation that we're talking about, it's the problem, the solution, how you're going to do it, what you need and the team that's going to drive it they're the main cause if you can get that message across really clearly and precisely the devil is in the detail and that is subject to conversations and the data room that ben mentioned all of those things kick in afterwards always have all the information to hand for when you're asked the questions but don't necessarily give it all out in one blurb at the start and bore the investor to tears and if there is a time limit on the presentation whether you do it pitching live or it's actually going up on a platform stick to the time limits don't waste time that's my best advice yeah absolutely and you know building on experience other people that have gone through it watching other people do it as well is another great way of uh, you know sharpening up what you what you put in front of investors at, uh, at some stage so thank you for that uh, next question is coming from Paul, and this one's going to come to you, Fran. Um, how do you protect your IP or patent when approaching groups of angel investors en masse? Hmm. Um, it is an interesting question. It's one we get asked a lot because obviously everyone's very um, conscious that they don't want to put something out there and then someone will run away and steal it. Um, and I don't know, you, I, as a lawyer, you kind of end up feeling quite torn because obviously you do want to ensure that companies and their ideas are properly protected but you could end up going mad if every single time you had a conversation with someone you asked them to sign an NDA and to be honest they would probably run a mile as well just like oh that is too much you know it's not really what I was getting in for um, and you know even people mention it with VCs for instance oh should I ask them to sign an NDA before I um, before I go to them with my idea and send them a pitch deck no is the answer really um, they just wouldn't really appreciate it to an extent in kind of the, you know, in terms of the relationship, it's not really a really great way to start. They're not, they're not interested in taking the idea and running with it. And it, it wouldn't, it just wouldn't look good to be honest. Um, so you want to ensure that your IP and your patents are properly protected in general. Um, you know, you definitely need to get advice on that and ensure that you've got proper protections in place. But in terms of protecting it against investors, mm. it's not I'll, it's something I'll, that I a lot. If, if I can add in onto that as well, Fran's completely right. It's completely inappropriate to ask someone to, 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 to enter a seven year legally binding contract with you. They don't even know who you are. Absolutely madness. So no NDAs. The other thing is what we have said is that if there's something that's particularly secret source esque, you don't want to share, don't share it. Just talk about the impact of it. Just talk about how good it is. Just talk about the story. You don't have to share the secret source. When it comes to Ben reference about having a data room, when it comes to kind of opening everything up, that's when you could absolutely sign and get him to sign an NDA. And they'd be very happy to sign a non-disclosure agreement to say that we're not going to take it or steal it as well. But but honestly, you you just gotta you just gotta get out there and make noise about your passionate, amazing solution that you've got, and people will then start to invest and back in it. And if if it's not if you can't protect it in any way and someone can steal it and nick it, then the chances are there's someone already doing it anyway, to be honest, from experience. There's about eight other startups elsewhere in the country who've already done it and and 14 others in the States doing it. So, you know, it's what it is. Yeah, sound advice. Uh, ben, was there anything that you wanted to add in terms of the founder's perspective of... For sure, for sure. Uh, I've absolutely been victim to this. Um, when we first started back in 2019, uh, when we were merely a concept and an idea, uh, asking people to sign NDAs and, and things like that. And we naturally had zero luck. Uh, naturally, there comes a time of realization where you're thinking, hang on a sec, why, why am I doing all of this? You know, is it actually needed? Uh, and I think it's just something that all founders, you know, start with is that very, you know, you're going to be very protective over your idea. That's absolutely fine. But um, I think the risk is very, very low that these investors are going to pick up and run with something that you, you, you're putting in front of them. Uh, and, you know, the amount of ideas that hits their desk every day, um, you are merely a grain of sand on a beach uh, of, of, of investment opportunities that they've seen today. So 
uh, it's very, very important that you don't put extra hurdles in the way of, uh, of getting those conversations. Yeah, again, really, really good sound advice. John, from your perspective, with, you know, dealing with a lot of creative industries across the platform, it's probably a question that comes up quite a lot for you as well. How, how did, does the uh, university support founders from this perspective? Well, yes, yeah, so a couple of things I picked up from the previous sessions here that we, we don't endorse NDAs. We, we actually don't think that they actually work in real terms. And, you know, tying people up for seven years, it's, it's not going to happen. The, the whole concept of investors and founders is based upon trust. And you've got to trust, the founders got to trust the investors, the investors have got to trust the founders. And that, that forms the basis of what goes forward. Yes, you need the legal documentation. Yes, you do. And if you've got IP, it is protected per se, because you've got IP. So it's the pre-IP level that tends to be the dangerous level. And that's where research comes in. And of course, as a university, we are a research institution. So we understand the sensitivities of that um, totally. So that it's, it's important, but don't get hung up on it, is what I would say. Yeah, and I think with a lot of things, it's it's early engagement and early discussions about the process. I think that really kind of help here, and not leaving it too late in the process to, to box yourself into a corner of where, where you are. Um, brilliant, thank you for that. Um, right, this is this is a question that probably we could spend the rest of the, the time talking about. Uh, a question from Samantha: Can you talk about percentage and equity giveaway versus size of investment? So this is unlocking the dilution piece that that Ben was talking about probably valuations as well, which uh, is in this. So, Ben, you've had to go through this a number of times. Can you talk about your thought process in terms of, you said, don't be afraid of dilution, um, what that kind of looks like, and maybe put some numbers to it, if that helps. I can people. try. I can try. Yeah. Um, I, I think as a rule of thumb, I think they say don't try not to give away more than 15% of equity in any given round. Um, that's easier than said than done in for a lot of founders um, and a lot of startups. Um, but that's the general rule of, rule of thumb that's just chucked, chucked around. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily take that as gospel. But um, for us, we've had higher dilution in some rounds and we've had lower dilution in some rounds. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to weigh up. But I think try for as long as you can to retain above that 50% mark. Uh, that that overarching majority control in the business for as long as humanly possible. That's the overarching goal. Don't be worried about, okay, I did have 90% and now I've got 85%. That's not really where the challenge is. You know, I wouldn't get hung up on that. Uh, I think together as a founding team, ensure that you have over 50% um, for as long as humanly possible. Most people try and drag that through to Series A, Series B before they would ever drop below um, that 50% mark. And um, that's really kind of what I would advise. But it's Every founder story is different, but so it's, it's difficult to give perfect advice on that. Just to give a kind of, just to give a kind of, I guess, the broader view as well across industry. I mean, I think Ben's actually pretty much spot on. You tend to give, from an angel perspective, they tend to expect anything between ten to twenty five percent of a of a company's um, equity for any given funding round, um, and it's so it does vary significantly, but depending on on many factors, the winds, uh, the current, you know, the moon where it sits in the in the sky, it does it's so varied, and it is all about kind of instinct as well. Um, kind of to help people value their businesses, it's really hard to do that. But actually, as a rule of thumb, um, your valuation is actually really based on how much you could feasibly raise. So given your traction, the quality of your team, how big the opportunity is, you know, given all that kind of noise and feel, how much do you think you could successfully raise to investors? And typically it's, you then, if, you, if that figure comes out as half a million pounds, then you're gonna to look to probably offer up between 15 to 25% of your business in exchange for half a million pounds. And that is roughly then gives you your approximate valuation. And now that, at those early stages, that's really the only way to do it, to be quite honest. As you get more advanced, you have discounted cash flows is how, how the VCs operated. But you can't discount cash flows that you and your accountant made up in the first place. Um, so it's not fair. So with these, so it's, it changes as you grow a little bit. But that at those early stages, that's typically how it operates. Um, and Ben's really, really good point about trying to stretch out and retain that equity. I think that's really key. Um, from an investor's perspective, I do want to put this out there. A lot of you have seen Dragon's Den where they're like, I want, I want 51% of the business in exchange for £4.73. It's nonsense. <laughs> really good investors. They want, they don't want control unless they have to. They really don't want to do it. That's why they're investing in you so that you run the business. 
But ultimately, the bigger piece is that they understand that unless the founding team have sufficient equity um, in the business, that founding team is not going to be incentivized to carry on driving, pumping, and trying to make that business a success. And so the investor will just lose all their money anyway because the business will fail. Another thing is, when it comes to that Series A, B venture round, those VCs also recognize that when they make an investment, they want the founders to have enough skin in the game um, to, to, to justify it. So if they think that the previous investor has been too greedy, it might not invest and the company won't raise and it will fail. So really, actually, investors, surprisingly enough, are also incentivized to make sure that they don't, aren't taking too much equity. Sensible investors, anyway. I'm sure there's some some loose cannon cowboys out there, but um, but sensible investors are, are actually also incentivized to make sure founders retain a lot of equity too. Yeah, and it, it's again, it's another example of drawing on other people's experience about how these rounds operate. Um, from a legal perspective, Fran, does that how often does that come up in the discussions that you have? Um, so I suppose it's not necessarily a legal point per se. There's lots of legal aspects that come into it. So the very good point about the founder incentives, um, you know, that then relates to things like vesting and lever provisions and also an option pool, um, which all all of those terms and all of those different um, things relate to incentivizing the founders properly. And that is such a key thing, um, you know, as a lawyer and also as an angel investor, you are only really investing and working with the founders. They are the key people to the business. It's so important. Um, I think one of the one of the things that we're coming across quite a lot at the moment is where um, companies have issued equity to advisors and there is a lot of that that happens and to an extent it's fine you know it's something that lots of companies do it's a way of getting advice but not having necessarily to pay for it obviously you are paying for it because you're giving them a chunk of your company the problem comes firstly if you give advice there's too much because they then just sit there with a chunk of your company and then and they're not really doing anything um and it ends up being called dead equity because they cannot be involved in the company anymore at all. They don't provide any more advice. They don't provide any money and they've just got a chunk. Um, so with that particular issue, I just say be really careful about how much you give away to advisors. Don't kind of just treat equity as like, oh, we'll just give them this and we don't have to spend any money. It's great. It could cause really big problems down the line. OK, thank you. John, very quickly, was there anything you wanted to add on this? Well, yes, yeah, so, um, there are people, there are investors out there who will take 51% of your business. But if you've got a B to C proposition that's ready to go to market, that, and you want a billion pounds worth of global uh, income revenue in a very short period of time, then they're the kind of people that you want to engage with. But they are the exception. They're not the norm. And I agree with Fran about very low percentages, 1% for giving advice to the business. You don't need to give more than that. I think there is there are extremes at both ends, and you just got to gauge it. We encourage less than twenty five percent. We we're more inclined to encourage less than ten percent uh, at this early stage. But lots of investors investing at just under ten percent. Okay. Um, one more question uh, out here, and then. We have got a number that are building up behind, so we might need to keep our answers maybe a little bit short and punchy just to, to kind of get through this. Um, question from Josephine. Where can entrepreneurs go if their innovation does not fit any finance house or grant funding opportunity? So if it's a bit different, so different, that there doesn't appear to be people that want to engage with that part of the sector. Has anybody got a view on that? Um, I'll step in. We do see a lot of um, founders with inventions which don't actually solve a problem. It probably solves a problem they have that no one else has. And that then begs the question, is this ready for market? What else could it be used for? So I would question the innovation if it doesn't fit one of the standard settings. Having said that, it's the exceptions that make the rules. And I think it's it's very much dependent on the sector that you're in and linking up with the environment of that sector, because there will be there'll probably be an experience somewhere. So, you know, if, if you're in a particular sector, try and seek out investors and support mechanisms that specialize with, within that. OK, um, next question. Um, I must admit, I've not heard of this. It's a question from Paul Griffiths. Can you 
please explain what a safe fundraising round is. So whether that's an, an acronym or not, I don't know. S A F E. <laughs> is it? <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, it it's is. Like yeah, yeah, it's a perfect, yeah. Cat, perfect fan. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah, it's the same as um what more people might have heard of as an ASA, which is an advanced subscription agreement. So the safe um is the US version of that. Um and it is um very simply uh an agreement where investors advance cash to the company for the promise of the issue and allotment of shares on a trigger event usually being a priced equity round. Um, so it's, a, in theory, <laughs> a quick and easy way to get money into the company without actually having to issue shares at that point. Um, and it's most commonly used where the company might not have a valuation yet. Okay, or, it so. to, or it needs to do a fast funding round as well, potentially. Because one yeah. of the big things could be like arguing over equity and valuation, as you can see, it's a bit of a, can be a bit of a spicy topic. So what this does is that basically, look, give me some money now. And when I raise some money next time, which will be of someone who really knows what they're doing, they're a big institution, they'll value me really, really carefully. Um, we'll value your shares at that price, but maybe they'll discount by like 20%, 10% often, whatever it is. Uh, and we just do it that way. Um, and that makes life a lot easier as well. It's a fast way of doing things. ASAs, advanced subscription agreements, are also EIS and SEIS eligible if they're within they, 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 the long stop in like six months or something like that. Ben, have you used ASAs? Have you used ASAs? We, we have indeed, yeah. So we did that during our bridge uh, in the build up to the seed round. We did uh, ASA. Um, so, you know, it's very familiar with it. It was, it, it was okay. It, 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 it worked it well. Um, the one downside I'd say to it is angels and, and some individuals are less keen on it because there is no price on the round. It's very, you know, uh, subjective to, you know, where it could end up. So um, actually, people like, rounds, people like name, information. So your institutional would have actually not necessarily be a really advanced Series A kind of like careful valuation positioning. So I can see why they'd be a bit more... More, exactly uh, exactly uh, I, I know it's a it's a very common thing in the, the united the us uh, to do kind of uh, convertible notes which kind of similar but obviously without all the protections um but you know for uk less so but it, it's good as you said if you want a quick round uh, and you don't want to put a price on it just yet it's good but you might struggle a bit more to find the right investors super thank you very much one very last question because i appreciate we're, we're running out of time um, Rod, you mentioned equity crowdfunding. Got a question from Erin that says, does equity crowdfunding make more restrictions for angels and VCs in the long run? Mm, good question. Uh, not necessarily. It can do. There's been a bit of a history. When it first came out, um, you would end up with basically a thousand people on your cap table directly. And that caused a lot of problems. And they very quickly started to use what's called a nominee structure where they wrapped it up into a separate company. So you have one investor on the cap table. The short answer is nowadays, cap table management and long lists of investors, not in the thousands, but in like 10, 20, it's all quite normal to be honest. If when a VC gets a bit annoyed by having lots and lots of investors on the list when they come to want to invest, sometimes they wrap them up or they get rid of them, they buy them out, they give them, they give them some money off on the table and off they go, they clean them out. So it's not a massive problem. It's talked about a lot, but in reality, that's yeah, fine. Um, I don't think so. Ben, how many, how many, how many, how many lines have you got on your cap table, dare I ask? um it's around about 25 i believe so it, 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 it's 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 definitely on the, the higher side um Isn't it a big, do you think you know, it's a big deal are you worried about i don't think it's i don't think, think it's a big deal in fairness do you see we, you do a lot of deals in this space do you think people care much about a little long, too long 25 long cap table maybe a 2000 uh no not in terms of the pure numbers but the main thing people would be worried about is is has the company properly managed it uh, you know, if it's very, very um, messy and on a spreadsheet that doesn't look very tidy and it looks a bit, you know, all over the place, then that probably would raise concerns if it's probably there, managed. Yeah, yeah. The, the fact that there's a large number. And, uh, and all advisors that can't come forward of equity. Yeah. yeah, and it also depends how engaged they all are. If you've got 20 investors that you don't speak to anymore and don't care, then that probably is a problem. If you've actually got 25 really cool angel investors and some advisors and a couple of VCs, that's great. Everyone wants to support you and put their money in. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, time is against the crowd, right? Yeah, I think it's important to note there, Paul, that if you've got 25 investors, you do need to talk to all the investors on your cap table. So just bear that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Multi-threaded conversation. Um, Thanks ever so much for your input. Um, I hope that you know some of the, the stuff that's come out of today's discussion has proved useful to those attendees.
Um, apologies if we haven't got to your questions. We're sitting in the chat. We will endeavour to get those answered and um, back out to you uh, around that. I, I think there's been a couple of questions about the slides which should be available on, on the system here for you to tap into. If not, please do reach out to us afterwards and we'll see if we can get those slides to you. Um, so thanks once again, Rod, John, Fran and Ben, especially, you know, bringing a, a founder's perspective to it. Thanks ever so much for your input and support. And I'd like at this stage to bring my colleague Andy in to uh, formally close off uh, today's um, proceedings. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andy Littlewood. I'm the MD for IT at the British Business Bank. And uh, in bringing today's session to a close, really just want to reflect on what a fantastic event that's been really sort of looking at options around funding, some great insight into those, some great insight into real life events, and hopefully the Q, uh, QA and A sessions been invaluable too. And, you know, the bank set up the Business Finance Week very much for this reason, bringing people together, helping smaller businesses find out about routes into funding, helping businesses to start up, scale up and stay out of the competition. And hopefully the, the speakers today and the panel discussions really provided with information and inspiration for your onward journey. So I'd like to add my thanks to Rod, Ben, Fran and John uh, for the contributions and the support they've given to Business Finance Week. Uh, but it doesn't end there. So don't forget we've got a number of other events through the remainder of the week. I hope you'll be able to join us for some of those. And if you go to our uh, British Business Bank website, you can see the events that are still to take place. You can sign up for those if you want to. And we'll also be making, to Paul's point, the, the webinar recordings available over the coming days so you can catch up on anything that you might have missed or revisit some of the sessions that you might want to, uh, to, to, to revisit. So in the meantime... Thanks again for being with us today. Very much look forward to hearing how your business journey uh, continues and evolves. So please do stay in touch with us. Thank you very much.